Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination, cultivating true contentment, the art of living a life of quality over quantity. Visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, at our simplified URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From a Monday motivational post, recipes, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and reader's favorite regular weekly post, This and That, which is posted each Friday morning. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 346th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. We have a treat for you today. Joining us on the show for an hour-long conversation is American interior designer living in Paris, David Jimenez. He has a new book out titled Parisian by Design, Interiors by David Jimenez. And we will talk about this beautiful book, a book that includes the seven residences that he has called home throughout his life journey, two of which now are where he lives, as he explains in our conversation. But we also go deeper, and that is why I was drawn to inviting him on this podcast. David is going to talk about the gifts of his curiosity, why it's important to trust your journey, and what he has learned over the years when it comes to making the best decision for his life even when he couldn't be certain of how it would all unfold. As well, he's going to share some wisdom that he has carried with him his entire life that was given to him by his mother. It involves the term inquietude, which loosely translated means a stirring in my heart. He'll speak directly to how that has influenced his decisions and his life journey. And, well, I think we should get to our conversation. I will also share that David's Petit Plaisir is, well, it's more than just one, (laughs) which is fantastic. And it actually is shared in the middle of our conversation. I will let you know when that is. But first, let me introduce you to David Jimenez. A new decor book recently released on October 18th, Parisian by Design, Interiors by David Jimenez, is an ideal gift to give that Francophile on your holiday gift list for not only someone who appreciates quintessential Parisian decor aesthetic, but a detailed source list of David's recommended shops for antiques, brocants, art galleries, bookshops, auction houses, and so much more in Paris. And he even takes us down to Lille sur la Sorgue in Provence. And if you, like me, are a Francophile, be sure to gift this to yourself and add it to your library tout de suite. And joining us from San Francisco, whilst in the middle of his book tour for Parisian by Design, welcome to The Simple Sophisticate, David. Good morning, Shannon. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you joined us. I, 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 I know we're just going to let them see or listen to us. They're not going to see the video, but you're, you're, I have your book right here with me. Um, and it's a, it's a partner project uh, working with Diane Doran Sakes. Um, I want to first begin because this has already been a petit plaisir on the podcast, episode 344. So the readers already, the listeners already know I love this book. So I'm just tickled pink that you're on the show today. Um, But when I posted that this was a petit plaisir, one of the first uh, responses from a listener was, 
David is living the dream. And and that was all she needed to say, because for us Francophiles, for those of us who appreciate the French culture, this is this is a life that would be just ideal, at least from what we we've experienced. And your life journey is just so deeply inspiring. So I want to begin. What was the catalyst that brought you to France from the States now just over six years ago? And you're calling Paris home. So what, what was it that brought you to France and um, made this opportunity available? Thank you for such a beautiful introduction, Shannon. It's, it's sincerely my pleasure to be here uh, and to be your guest this morning. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, I, I've got to say, if there were something very specific uh, to answer your question would be, you know, my love for Paris. Uh, that, that, was, that was the catalyst. That, that truly was the inspiration and the motivation uh, it's it's hard to describe uh, the impact that uh, that it's had on my life. Uh, it has so much to do with, I think it has to do with the beauty of the city, certainly. And and I think anyone that's visited Paris uh, knows that and 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 can probably relate. Uh, but then it goes deeper than that. You know, it's 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 the it's the food, it's the culture, it's it's this very European uh, way of living. Uh, the way that they approach friends and relationships, uh, how they eat, where they eat, and all of that, I just find so incredibly romantic and dreamy and fun and unlike uh, my my day-to-day world in the United States uh, and in many ways so aspirational because it paints a picture of something that, that's a different way of, of, of living, a different way of enjoying of joining time with friends and family. And I think all of that just created such an enormous amount of, of desire early on to want to experience it more and more. And, uh, you know, I started going to Paris early on on, 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 on my very first time there was on a business trip later on, subsequently on trips for myself. And it got to a point where every year for my birthday, uh, for a week in July, I was traveling to Paris for 10 days, seven to 10 days and it was heaven. It was heaven because I, I got to really immerse. And then certainly the more time I spent there, the more time I wanted to be there. And, and the more, the, more uh, the desire to want to live there uh, became stronger. To be able to spend your birthday f- for 10 days there, that would, be, that would be lovely. What a great gift to yourself. Um, and, and I want to speak to where you live now. You live on the Ile Saint-Louis, which is one of the two small islands in the middle of Paris um, on the Seine. And you have a design atelier um, that's just literally steps away from your home, which is brilliant. I love that that proximity. Um, the first half of Parisian by Design profiles seven of your homes along your journey and five of them in France, of which two of these are the two spaces I just mentioned, your apartment um, on Ile Saint-Louis and your atelier. Diane Doran Six, who wrote the book with you, shares that Paris and its many charms, speaking to what you just shared with us, serve as a driving force and inspirations for so many of your projects. Can you share what it is? And you kind of already touched on this, but what I really appreciated, I was looking at your Instagram feed, the community and the neighborhood that you have right there, what what brought you to, uh, to, to Ile Saint Louis seems to be a genuine home of people that appreciate each other, are there for each other. Can you walk us through what it's like to live there? Absolutely. And, and just before I answer the specificity of that question, I do want to share with you a little bit about, about uh, working with Diane and, and why I admire her so much. Uh, she was able to capture the nuance of what I felt largely because she also lived in Paris and because she also has such a strong passion for France. And uh, Together, when the concept of the book started to develop, there was so much energy and excitement about how much we could put into the book and how many pages we could fill with beautiful images of of, of design projects, certainly, but also of France and uh, places that have either inspired my work or artisans that I've worked closely in developing relationships with to uh, create bespoke product for design projects. And just sheer beauty, places that are of interest, that are are inspiring. And so the more we talked about it, the more excited we got about it. And I think uh, when you go or read through the pages, at least uh, I, I hope that 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 the level of joy and love 
that we feel for France comes through uh, in the book. And I, and I really do think it does. At least I hope it does. Uh, so when I read the words that she used to describe so many of the moments that I had shared with her, it sort of encapsulates it for me. It makes it, it underscores through her words uh, how I felt. And, and, and there's a sort of a beautiful reciprocity in that. To answer your question about about East Saint Louis, it's been it's been magical. So I, I uh, arrived in Paris not knowing exactly where I would live, and in my heart, I decided that what I wanted to do was live in Saint Germain des Prés. Uh, I don't know why. It's just <laughs> I think every American that goes to Paris falls in love with Saint Germain des Prés. I think it has to do with, well, you, you know it, Shannon. It has to do with you know the, the beautiful cobblestone streets and the great little little shops. And uh, well, what what do you love about Saint Germain des Prés? What do you love about that area? Well, I was just going to say it's it's often told that 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 arrondissement is often told through the American writers, right? That's where we always hear about Hemingway being and Gertrude Stein, and so we think, oh, that's where my dreams are. I mean, I, I think just unconsciously that's where we're drawn to first, and then we start to explore. There's a magic to that area, uh, the winding streets and and the romance associated with it, and so I was really fixated on wanting to live there. Well, sadly. After about four attempts, it didn't happen uh, for a whole host of reasons. And each one sort of funnier and more dramatic than the last. It went from everything from a, an apartment that I, I actually physically moved into that had major plumbing issues. And they ended up having to evacuate everyone that lived in the building as a result of my apartment because there were so many, so many uh, significant problems with the plumbing uh, to a whole host of other things that happened that, that, that made it clear that Saint-Germain-des-Prés wasn't in the cards for me. And one of the things that I've realized along my way in my journey is that, you know, when you come against something that is not happening, that's not clicking, that's not going the way that you anticipated it might be going, that might just be a sign from the universe saying, this isn't the right direction to be going. And rather than continue to, to pursue it or push really hard, to maybe take a moment to reflect and step back and say, what what is the universe trying to tell me here? What what can I learn? What should I be looking at differently? And I started thinking about an, 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 a new adventure in in Paris that wouldn't be Saint Germain des Prés, and where would that m- might be? And and I opened my area of search up, and I found the most unbelievable apartment in uh, the Eighth Arrondissement, uh, right off of Avenue Marceau, which is a block and a half over from Champs Elysees. So if you know Champs Elysees. And you've got this incredible triumphant avenue, uh, which is dazzling uh, and and full of just really beautiful shops. This was two blocks away, and I lived there for about three years. And in fact, that's the image that's on the cover of the of the book. It was an incredible experience, and I loved it. I loved the apartment certainly, and I loved the area because it was so different from anything that I, from anywhere or any place that I, I'd lived before. But what I found after a few years was that I really wanted the charm. That other part of Paris that I've seen, you know, in books and that you you watch in movies and and that, I, you know, I certainly had experienced in many neighborhoods uh, just just uh, on my travels through Paris. And I I decided that I wanted to find a new place. And one of the places that had always touched my heart, sort of pulled at my heartstrings was Ile Saint-Louis. And the reason is Ile Saint-Louis, as you mentioned, is one of two very small islands. It's right in the heart of Paris. And there's a community that's there uh you know, during the day, there's a lot of tourists because we also have the benefit of having one of the most spectacular uh, ice cream destinations. <laughs> have you have you had their ice cream? I heard that in the other interview. I was like, oh, I, I have to try this yeah, place out the, now. <laughs> the most incredible ice cream. And and so that's a huge draw. Plus, being so close to the Notre Dame Cathedral uh, also is another really big draw. It's within steps of the Notre Dame Cathedral. But at about six o'clock, you know, the island uh, gets very calm. And and it's it's just the locals, it's just the residents, and uh, because it's such a small island, uh, you know, you 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 want to stay on the island. You want to partake of the restaurants that, that are there. You want to shop at the butcher. You want to shop at the flower shop and the cheesemonger, and eat at all of the cafes. And and you develop these relationships that become uh, that become really deep friendships. And I care about this community, and I've experienced COVID. Uh, with this community. And I experienced the burning of, of the Notre Dame Cathedral with this community. And I've experienced some, you know, some really s- serious attempts on Paris with this community. And so I feel, and they've embraced me in a really beautiful and very authentic way. And so when I'm there, I feel 
I feel very much like I'm at home. I, I feel uh, honored. I feel grateful uh, that in spite of being so far away from my family and friends in the United States, I have an adopted family in Paris uh, that I, I care about very much that I get to spend time with. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's pretty special, very, very special to me. It sounds like it. Yeah, I really enjoyed your series. You did one of your Instagram uh, postings of each of the individuals in their shops and you profiled them and introduced them. And I just, it was clear that you had genuinely built relationships with this community and that they too have embraced you. So that there's something powerful in that to make something, to make it feel even more at home. I, uh, I love that you shared that uh, the the first apartment, so the apartment attempts to to stay um, initially on the Saint Germain de, Germain de Prix um, were a bit of a headache, and you had to take note and you had to take stock of what is why is this happening. Um, I want to start back at the beginning of your journey because for those of you, those of the listeners who may not know, you started in the Bronx. You started in this place going, what should I do? And you base seem to just let the universe guide you and you put your whole heart into your work and it just started to unfold. I want to speak to that trusting your journey, having the courage to step forward into the unknown at such a young age. I think that's, that's what in, was inspiring to me. Now I'm sure it's more conscious. So my question to you um, is you have spoken about your embracing of what you know you do well, but also what you love doing and that contributes to other people's life in in a way that they want, but can't figure out for themselves. And so they come to you. And so I want to ask you, where did this clarity or this courage come from? How do you nurture that? What grounds you, what anchors you to trust that the next step was the right step for you, even if maybe other people didn't understand or no one else that you knew had done it before. Such a powerful question. I, I will say that, uh, when I was growing up in the Bronx, uh, and so my, my family, uh, my mother and father are both from the island of Puerto Rico, and they actually, they met in the Bronx, fell in love and had uh, two children. My brother's six years older than I am. And we grew up off of White Plains Road in the Bronx, which was at the time a, a lovely neighborhood, lots of single family homes, uh, and a great community and, and terrific neighbors. Uh, I went to the public high school system, uh, PS21, and it was rough. It was a really a rough, uh, it was a rough place to be. I think just because it was a rough place to be, I don't know how to put it other, other, other than that, uh, at a very young age had in Spanish, what we call un inquietud. Uh, I had a stirring in my, in my soul, in my heart. I felt like, uh, I, I had a desire for something more than what I was experiencing and I couldn't, at that young age, identify what it was, and I certainly didn't have the knowledge or uh, the sort of the the experience to put a finger on on what that could be or what the opportunities might be. But what I knew was that there was a stirring in my soul, and that stirring propelled me, and it made me feel uh, like I needed to experience more. And I listened to that stirring. And I very easily could have stayed in the Bronx and uh, and been happy and and finished uh, high school and and taken a job in the Bronx or decided what college I was going to go to and eventually choose my path. But at the earliest age, the moment I was I was I was finished with uh, with high school, I decided that really what I wanted to do was was look for something different. And I remember the trips to Manhattan that I would take with my parents. And I knew that there was something really enticing about that. It felt, uh, it felt like an opportunity to grow in new ways. It wasn't clear how I might grow, but I knew that there was something there. And I'll re- always remember getting on the number two train uh, from the Bronx and I got off at 59th and Lexington. And I had three, three options for where to potentially go and submit an application. One was Bloomingdale's. Uh, one was Alexander's for any New Yorkers that are on the on the podcast or listening to the podcast uh, might remember uh, Alexander's, the old department store. And then the Gap was on the other corner. And so I thought Bloomingdale's seemed beautiful, but maybe a little intimidating for a 17 year old, 18 year old. And Alexander's was definitely not a place that I wanted to work. That was clear. Uh, and then the Gap, I thought, well, you know, there's I see a lot of people that are my age that are young and it seems like a dynamic sort of fun place. And I think I'll get a discount. On, on jeans and things. So it seemed like a, the practical choice. And uh, 
I'll never forget this because I, I, I walked in and I asked the gentleman behind the desk, uh, behind the cash trap, are you, are you hiring? Are you hiring? And he said, yes. And he immediately pulled out a pad and he said, take this application. Why don't you walk around the corner? There's a cafe, sit down, uh, fill it out and bring it right back to me. And I did. Came back, he took me downstairs, he interviewed me and he hired me on the spot. And it, it was hard to fathom, like I, I, I couldn't understand how this happened so quickly uh, or what had just happened, but I, I felt grateful to him for this opportunity. I wasn't really clear on what it was that he could have possibly seen in me because I had no experience whatsoever in retail, certainly had never sold anything before. But I suspect that he, he felt my sincere desire and my, my passion for wanting to learn and, uh, and my openness to, to this opportunity. And uh, I, so this is probably the most powerful part of the story is that when I was growing up, my mother would always say, it doesn't matter what you do in your career, what you choose to do. She said, just make sure that you put your heart and all of your passion into it. That's beautiful. That's great advice to follow. And you clearly have been following that. It was powerful because on my way back home, I decided on the number two train back to the Bronx, I will be the best damn salesperson this place has ever seen before. <laughs> and that opened the door because I would get there an hour earlier than my shifts. I would stay a few hours later than my shift because I just wanted to learn. And uh, and I would be determined to sell the most pocket T-shirts and web belts and uh, E.G. Smith socks that I could uh, because... <laughs> I was motivated and, and I was being acknowledged. And I felt for the first time in a long time, I felt like I was growing in exponential ways. I was learning new things. I was applying myself. I was getting great reinforcement and feedback. And it all came from a place of goodness. It all, it all felt uh, aligned to something that was fueling my heart and made me feel like I had purpose. I had purpose because I was doing something that I enjoyed, helping people at this job, being a good employee. And I somehow, had, I just had this feeling that this was going to generate new opportunity and, and, and betterment. And subsequently, that became, uh, Shannon, the launch into my career in retail. From a salesperson, very quickly, I became an assistant manager. They offered me an opportunity to become a store manager. Uh, I traveled, I lived in Boston. I ran the Newberry Street store on uh, in Boston for Banana Republic at the time. I, I changed from, from Gap to Banana, to Banana Republic. Uh, and my career evolved all because of the stirring in my soul when I was in school and the voice that I think we all hear and that we all have that I listened to, that I said yes to and, and, and decided to take a chance and a risk. And you honored that. Yeah, you trusted something, even even though you didn't know what was the next, uh, what was going to come. I think, well, that's that's what I think is beautiful about this, because it, it may seem a dream to a lot of people, but it can be a reality. We just have to trust that something else that we can't know. There's a, there is a stirring, as you said, for a reason. And um, I think that's I think I think your book and your life just exemplifies that beautifully. I want to speak because you spoke to uh, something that I want to ask you about when you work with clients or you're working on decor projects, because it's the idea of them trusting you and you getting to know them and creating a space where they feel genuinely at home. You have shared that when you work with clients, each project will reveal who the inhabitants are, what they love and how they live rather than a trademark, so to speak, um, you, David Jimenez, it, it's going to be about them, but it's your expertise that you're bringing, which that is a talent in and of itself. What is your journey when you work with clients to understand what and how you will approach their project? And how can someone who is trying to redecorate, so maybe they can't work with you, but they can pick up this book and they can listen to this podcast. What is it that they need to understand about either what they love or themselves so that they can create a home that they've envisioned in their mind is a dream reality. What is that process? Um, so I, I'll, I'll start by sharing that I, I think that because of my background in retail, I'm a better designer. Um, so at, at the heart, I, I enjoy people very much and I enjoy working uh, 
with people. And I'm a good listener. Uh, I'm very aware of nuance. And my, my, my goal is to really hopefully understand with great precision and detail what, what, is, what is being asked. And so I share that my, my career in retail has influenced what I do in design because I've had the pleasure of working with CEOs and presidents that have very clear visions for what they aspire to have within a store environment. And they may uh, be able to articulate that with such laser sharp preci- precision that you can see it and in a way you can feel it, but it's not, you're, not, you're not surrounded by it. And so it was always my role uh, as a VP or SVP or, or director of visual merchandising and design in, in many of those companies to help build the dream, to help, to help build the aesthetic and the point of view behind what that aspiration was or what that vision was. And so I would create these presentation boards and then eventually create a point of view in an actual room or setup. And through that process, there's a level of of trust that's developed, but then also a camaraderie, right? And so that next presentation furthers the evolution of the project. And so similarly, when I'm working with clients, uh, you know, my, my pleasure is being able to help someone bring their point of view, their taste level, their desire, their vision, to life with my expertise, my knowledge, my sources, my resources. And what I love, what I love is, is the, the happiness that I get, you know, the joy that I get out of knowing that when I'm, I'm, we're, we're complete, we're done with this project. You get to enjoy the space that you created because I did it with you. I didn't do it for you. And so there's a collaborative process that happens in the development of that. So, so the, to, to be very specific, the process usually starts with a conversation uh, where the client is speaking very specifically about their desires and, and what that might be, whether that's something that's more classical in sensibility or something that's more contemporary, something that's more clean lined or that's more layered and personal and collected. So those are a lot of words. Right. And then you've got to get real tactical about what that means. So show me is usually the next uh, phase of the conversation, which is, uh, you know, please pull some photographs on, on online, on Pinterest, uh, through tear sheets of magazines in order to be able to help me understand what it is. And, and by the way, I don't need you to pull together rooms. I just need to understand what touches you, right? So for example, if there's a photograph in a magazine and there's this beautiful light that's spilling in and uh, and it's hitting a piece of artwork in a certain way. And that, that moment that the color that's happening in the room, the spirit of the light that's, 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 that's projecting on a wall, the nuance of something that that's in a corner touches you. Tell me because that helps inform what you like, what your eye finds pleasing uh, and what, and what you ultimately might find nurturing or, or enjoyable about a room or a space. As I gain more information, uh, it helps me then narrow down the choices. And then the next thing that I enjoy doing very much is pulling together storyboards, photographic storyboards that that paint a picture that visually represent the point of view. Now, obviously, you know, tear sheets and photography can only get you so far. But generally, what I like to do with the storyboards is, is capture a snapshot of what each individual room and the sensibility for what each individual room would look like. And that could include uh, uh, images that have some color references, but generally it's the vibe, it's sort of the spirit of the room. If it's a little bit more casual or more layered or uh, more edited, more refined, more elegant, uh, based on what I heard the client felt that they wanted to be surrounded by, it becomes a lot easier for me to, to deduce and go through this editing process to really find images that I think create the North Star for where we're going to go. And then once we've got that, then the process begins. And so the process is, again, another a very collaborative process. Uh, no purchase gets made without the direct involvement and approval of the client. Um, it's your money. I want to be responsible in ensuring that I spend it the way that you want it spent. Um, so there's never a moment when I just go off and shop for the client independent of the client knowing what I'm doing. And I've been trusted with credit cards and, 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 and budgets to be able to do that, but it's, it's not 
it's not my pleasure. I, I, I want to do this with you because it allows a level of engagement in the space that gives you the benefit of feeling and knowing exactly how it's coming together so that you get to steer it again in the end. So that when we're complete, uh, you've got a space that you always dreamed you could have, but maybe could have on your own might've had a real tough time putting together because you weren't sure where to go or how to get it started or how to find or source these pieces or how to put them together once you did have, have them. And I get the pleasure of knowing that I got to help you bring to life a space that every day that you put the key in the door and you, that door opens, it touches your soul. And, and that, that's the reward for me. That's the thing that makes me uh, happy. That gives me great pleasure. And that motivates me, that, that dry, drives me and gives me energy and, and keeps me working late into the night and getting up early in the morning and going shopping for clients and doing what I do because of that, of that enjoyment. Oh, that's beautiful. What what they say that um, doing what you love and finding something you love that provides constructive benefit to others that that is dharma, and to do that that is where you actually are fueled, not drained, and it clearly fuels you to, like you said, get up early in the morning, hop on that train, and go down to Provence and and shop those brocants and uh, <laughs> find those treasures. Um, what fun and what fun. And I can't imagine the feeling that you just described of when that client sees that finished room that you have worked together on. That's, I thought that that's a very, you did, you did it with them, not for them. What a beautiful shift in perspective there. You mentioned sunlight. Um, you know, I think that's something sometimes people aren't aware of the power of light in their rooms and how it affects them throughout the day. Um, and as I was going through the um, profile of your apartment in um, the countryside in France, which I want to talk about, I have to admit that was probably one of my favorite of your seven res residences. I just, I fell in love with the space outdoors and indoors. And I want to talk about the sunlight because you talked about two different um, nooks or corners in this space that you you basically made sure that when the sunlight came in or when the, the, the light was such that this would be an honored space or, or, or a special space. First of all, how did you find this gem? What drew you to the countryside? Because you are in Paris most of the time. Talk to me a little bit about um, your apartment. Now, this apartment, first of all, people, for my listeners, is is on the grounds of a 16th century chateau, which is located just outside of uh, Santines, um, which is near Chantilly. Um, but how did you find it? What drew you to wanting to have a place out in the countryside? I do just want to clarify, you've made reference twice about my seven homes. And I, I just want to clarify that, in fact, these, these, these in fact, are, are my seven homes, but I don't own all of them today. <laughs> I don't want to leave any more than this perception. <laughs> the misperception. I, I'm, I, 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 uh, I have all of these places today. In fact, uh, it's it's a very tender part of the story. Uh, you know, each one of these these residences has been really important to me and meaningful to me, and I've had the pleasure of of being there, setting it up for my own purpose. And along the way, uh, deciding that I would get them recorded and photographed. And so, my advice for anyone that's aspiring for a career in interior design, sometimes the very best work that you can present is your own work. And early on, uh, if you can align yourself with a photographer that you trust and that you admire and that can start taking photographs of your work and uh, start building a body of work, it's a great way to have as a resource for the future. Whether you decide that you're going to have that published or or save it for a website for the future or for a future project potentially because you're still uh, wanting to develop a, a body of work. Uh, I encourage anyone that 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 has any aspirations in design to to photograph what they do because it's the best way to to then demonstrate uh, the breadth of what of what you're capable of doing. So I started doing that at an early age uh, with my very first home. And, and then subsequently did that with, with all of the rest. And one of the things that, that's interesting to look at now as you look at the book, and it's really funny because I hadn't reflected on this until I spent some time with Diane paginating the book, is that there really is such a strong European thread or uh, sort of this European aesthetic or, or filter against each one of these properties, whether it's Knob Hill in San Francisco, uh, certainly Yves Saint-Louis in Paris, 
or Kansas City, Missouri uh, on the plaza, there's uh, this 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 thread, this aesthetic thread that holds them all together. Um, part of it is the quality of the f- photography because I've worked with some terrific photographers along the way, and I've been directing the images and how they they uh, get taken. But then also just the the real the actual sensibility of of the spaces and the homes. But I want to go back to your question about about uh, this very very special property in 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 France, and so. I'm not sure if we mentioned this yet, but my apartment on Ile Saint Louis is tiny. So I went from an 80 square meter apartment, which is maybe equivalent to around 800 square feet. I might, I might have the calculation off. I might have the calculation off, but it's it, it's it's approximately that. I've been in square feet now for almost seven years, so or square meters in, in, in for almost seven years. So you kind of lose you lose the point of reference a little bit. But uh, 800 uh, square feet was the previous apartment uh, on Avenue Marceau. And now the new apartment in East San Luis is half of that. So it's, a, it's, 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 it's quite literally a pied de terre. You know, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tiny uh, little apartment with an enormous amount of charm with you know, these soaring ceilings with gorgeous decorative molding detail and Versailles parquet floors and a beautiful marble fireplace and these massive windows uh, that look out onto Ile Saint Louis proper. So there's there's a, an enormous amount of romance uh, to the space, which is what drew me to it to begin with. Uh, but it is it is very small. And so after being there for several years and through and through the pandemic, I realized that I, I just needed more room, and I I had an aspiration for a larger space. And I decided that I would just put it out in the universe that I I, I wanted I wanted a new home. I wanted a, a, a larger space. And I started doing a search and I found a few places that I'd fallen in love with that didn't work out. And rather than be devastated by it, I thought, okay, then it's just not the right, it's just not the right fit. And I held hope that I would find the right thing. And I saw images of this home. What was terrific about it was that it's uh, only 40, 45 minutes outside of Paris. So it's north of Paris. And I can get there by train. I go to the Gare du Nord. And uh, it's uh, two stops to get to uh, a city called, an imperial city called Compiègne. And from there, I can take a taxi to the home. And what's magical about the home is that when you arrive, there are these two iron gates. And so from the outside, it's from the exterior, it's, it's quite nondescript, but there are these two iron gates. And these iron gates open slowly when you press the button. And suddenly you're in the middle of this park and the park has these towering pine trees and weeping willows and apple trees. And, and it's, it's, you can hear all these birds in the background. Uh, And so there's just something really, really magical and transcendent. You, 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 you you walk past this threshold and, and suddenly you're in a very, very different headspace. And then there's this long path. And in fact, uh, on the pages of the book, uh, there's a photograph of the chateau and you can see the path that I'm describing, but there's a long path that leads up to the chateau. So when you first walk through the iron gates, you don't see the chateau. The chateau is tucked behind trees. And so not until you're maybe 50 feet on the path does the chateau at a distance start to reveal itself and it sort of pokes out and then you turn a corner and then suddenly you see the majesty that is this spectacular looking chateau. And then that's when your heart starts to race. And certainly my first time there, my first time there, I thought, wait, what? This is incredible. I mean, really like incredible. So then as you get closer, you realize that there's actually, there's a river uh, that, that runs through the property. There's this, this former tower uh, that lives in the center of the, right in the middle of the river that's facing the chateau. And uh, I now have the the what's called the l'étage noble, which is the the first level of the home, which is where the owners of the home normally would have resided. And so, as a result of that, um, that particular level uh, historically always has taller ceilings and has beautiful floors with ancient fireplaces. And the footprint is a much larger footprint than than uh, likely in many of the other apartments within the chateau. Now, the chateau at one point was owned by a single family. And in fact, the owner of the chateau owned most of the property within the village over many, many, many years. 
the chateau has burnt down several times. So this structure that I'm in right now is not the former structure from the 1600s. This one was built, I think, later on, like in the 1800s. So we have just arrived in the countryside with David at his apartment, and he is going to continue to talk about what he loves about this home. Oh, and it really is one of my favorites in the book. And that is hard to top. But first, I'd like to introduce you to two sponsors of today's episode. And when we come back is when David's going to share his petite plaisir, which captures a moment when he arrives at his apartment in the French countryside. We'll be right back in two minutes. If you haven't finished your holiday shopping yet, don't panic. I've got a secret source for incredible original gifts, and that's Uncommon Goods. UncommonGoods.com has gifts for everyone in your life. We're talking moms, dads, teens, in-laws, besties, your one and only. And it's not stuff you can find just anywhere. Uncommon Goods has unique and creative gifts, often handmade by independent artists and makers. So skip the gifts that scream last minute and find something truly original at UncommonGoods.com. One of my favorites I found was for the gardener on your list. It's a handmade ceramic hummingbird feeder. It doesn't even look like a hummingbird feeder. It looks like a little piece of art that you can hang in your garden. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S. From art and jewelry to kitchen, home, and bar, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone. Not the same lackluster gifts you could find just anywhere. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give back $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $2.5 million to date. As a simple, sophisticated listener, to get 15% off your next gift, go to UncommonGoods.com slash Sophisticate. That's UncommonGoods.com slash Sophisticate for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. The Simple Sophisticate is also sponsored by Bombas. Gifting is hard. Bombas makes it easy with socks, underwear, and t-shirts that feel good and do good. They feel good because they're thoughtfully designed with the softest materials, and they do good because for every item you purchase, Bombas donates another to someone in need. Whether it's those stocking stuffers for your nieces and nephews, or for the adults who... Let's just face it, we all need good socks, whether it's for walking, for running, for skiing, for moving through our everydays comfortably. Bombas has you covered. Bombas socks, underwear, t-shirts, and slippers are cozy upgrades to everyday basics and the perfect gift for everyone on your list, including yourself. Bombas uses materials like premium Pima cotton and ultra soft, never itchy merino wool in their socks and t-shirts and fuzzy Sherpa linings in their slippers. Bombas Holiday Collection puts a modern twist on traditional festive colors and designs. Think rich purples and greens, geometric snowflake designs, sweater-inspired textures, and retro ski patterns. With family sets, you can match with your family and friends in exceptional comfort and style. Hello, frameable holiday group photo. And did you know that socks, underwear, and t-shirts are the three most requested clothing items in homeless shelters? That's why Bombas donates one item for every item you buy. So far, Bombas has donated over 75 million items of clothing. That's a whole lot of comfort and a whole lot of good. As a simple, sophisticated listener, give the good this holiday season with Bombas. Go to bombas.com slash sophisticate and use code sophisticate for 20% off your first purchase. That's bombas, B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash sophisticate, code sophisticate for 20% off. Bombas.com slash sophisticate, code sophisticate. Welcome back. Let's slip back to the French countryside and let David continue with his tour. So one of the things that makes it great is that uh, the neighbors are incredibly private. And so uh, there is a great respect in maintaining and protecting each other's privacy and giving each other uh, distance. So there's never a point in time, which is, by the way, as I don't know if it's just as an American <laughs> or if it was just a personal thing, you know, but but if you're going to be in the country, the idea of of getting away sounds really appealing. 
being in a chateau where you have other families or people living seem somehow less enticing. What I realized very quickly uh, is that this is a way of life and, and uh, uh, everyone is very neighborly and very kind and cordial and, and incred- more than cordial, they're incredibly warm and gracious and hospitable. Uh, but they're also respectful of each other's time and space. And so uh, there's no expectation that we're going to have cocktails at five with everybody that lives in the chateau down at the, on the veranda. <laughs> that just, that I suppose we could do that if we decided that we wanted to. But in fact, I think everyone enjoys being there on their own so much and loves the opportunity of, of sort of the escapism behind uh, the quality time there that, uh, uh, you know, you see people through the course of the day, but but everyone sort of does their own thing. And so for me, one of the things that I enjoy the most is getting there on an afternoon, a late Friday afternoon after a, a full day of work in the city in Paris and arriving and just before arriving there, actually going to the market, uh, because by the way, this town is so small, there's nothing. So, so there is, <laughs> and when I say nothing, I really, I'm not exaggerating. I really mean literally the there's no, there's no there's no cafe there's no restaurant there's no there's no there's no there there's there's nothing um the only thing that exists which uh, i i'm very happy does exist is the post office that's directly across the way from where the chateau is located and funny story um when i first arrived i decided it would be the the, the proper thing to do to introduce myself at the post office and just let them know you know i'm i'm going to a new neighbor residing here. It just seemed like the right thing to do. I don't know. And they were very kind. And when I walked in, I noticed that they had all of these baguettes and croissants and all of these pastries in the post office, in the post office, like on the wall of the post office. They had all these fresh baguettes. And I thought, oh, happy day. This is going to be so great. So I can actually, I mean, this place is double duty. I can come to La Poste and, and, you know, do my mail, get some stamps. And get a baguette. I'm so happy. And it's directly across the street from my from my this from the chateau. Well, it turns out that each one of those baguettes uh had a name on it. And so there's a pre-order that you need to do the day before. So there's a system, as there would be. So the day before, there's a very orderly system. You call ahead and the post office reserves your baguette with the local bakery that then delivers it. So if you want un chocolat or uh, <laughs> or a croissant. Or baguette. You can certainly get it. You just need to call ahead for it. So I've done that a few times. Um, it's no, it is beautiful. But but here's where the pleasure is. The pleasure is going shopping to the farmer's market before arriving at the apartment. So I go and I buy enough food for however long I'm going to be at the, at the home, and then and then I take great great pleasure in cooking the entire time that I'm there for myself. And so, you know, I, I enjoy cooking very much. I learned how to cook uh, at an early age. My mom taught me and I've, you know, I've, I've picked up recipes along the way. Uh, and I enjoy, I especially enjoy cooking uh, French cuisine because, uh, because it seems like the right thing to do if you're in France <laughs> and, and it's delicious and flavorful and, and, uh, and, and fresh. And so, I plan my menu. I go shopping at the farmer's market. I bring all of this incredible loot back home to the, you know, to the apartment with me. I set it up. I stage it in the kitchen with bowls and baskets and I get fresh flowers. I go downstairs uh, into the garden and I take my shears with me and I, and I, I clip branches for, uh, for the home. So there's like this moment of the most wonderful decompression immersed in the beauty that is a space that's so otherworldly because I feel so transported in the heart of nature by this beautiful river surrounded by these gorgeous trees with the symphony of birds clipping branches in my backyard to set the stage for a beautiful evening at home where I get to light a fire and pour myself a glass of wine and light some candles and turn on some music while I'm cooking and take pleasure in every nuanced moment that that brings. And it, and it fills me beyond words, any stress, any, any concern, any preoccupation that I may have had completely disappears because of the magnitude of the beauty of 
of the place and the destination and how I feel when I'm there. And, and so it, it's, it, it's, uh, it feels my soul. Sounds so serene. I can see. Thank you for painting that beautiful picture for us. I know so many listeners are taking a big sigh <laughs> and just drinking that moment in. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Oh, I thought it was finished. Um, the beauty of the kitchen that you described, that picture that you captured um, with the flowers, with the market tote, the French doors that open up, and just standing in that space and cooking would calm me down after a long week in Paris. I mean, just a work day. But thank you for painting, truly painting that picture for us. That was, that was beautiful. I, I mean, that, I think you've already answered the last question. I said I was going to ask you what your petit plaisir is, and that one just covered five or ten of them. So um, thank you for sharing all those inspirations. As you reflect on your life journey thus far, we've talked about this being a dream as your reality. What would you like to say to people who, as you said, have a stirring, but maybe don't trust that they should take that step or explore it? What would you say to them? Mm, I, I would say, follow your dreams. Follow your dreams. Don't let anyone for a second uh, give you reason to question what innately, intuitively in your heart and your soul you feel. I think we all, you know, we, 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 we have, we have this inner voice that guides us. And I, I, I've learned over the years to pay attention to that voice and to trust it. There have been moments that I, you know, I've really questioned what the next right step was going to be and sometimes get really preoccupied with the future and where, where this might lead and what will happen when. And what I've learned more recently is just stay focused on the now. Just choose the next right step. Put the energy into the next right step and don't focus or worry so much about what the future is going to hold. Because if you make the next right step, that'll lead to the next right step. And inevitably, you're in the future and, uh, and it's exactly where you should be. And so if you just trust, if you just develop that, that, that muscle of, of trusting your intuition, trusting that voice. You said exactly the word that popped into my head. It's the sincerity that actually is the fuel that you don't realize is as powerful until you are living sincerely. When you're living sincerely, it seems to just kind of, as you just kind of, it reveals breadcrumbs. It reveals breadcrumbs and you want to go that way. And you I don't know how to describe it either, but I've made some similar decisions where no one else understood them, but it just felt right. I didn't know what was going to happen the next step, but you just do the next right thing, as you just said, which is perfectly described. And that actually is empowering in a way you can't quantify. It's, I don't know how to describe it either. I appreciate that you mentioned the sincerity. If it's genuinely what is coming from within, eventually you're going to make sense of it. But if you just have to keep exploring it. Um, but there's a deep peace that you radiate that is... I wish people could um, speak with you as I am and communicate with you as I've had the opportunity to do via our emails recently, but there's a genuine piece about you that tells me you are doing what you love. This is not a contrived journey of following someone else's, you know, you should do this, you should do that, Dave, but this is David's journey that he's just trusted. And I think it's beautiful and I think it's inspiring. And I want to thank you for putting this book together, but also introducing us to you as, because there's more, it's more than just the rooms. It's the soul. It's the human being that brought them together and also generally loves living this life. Thank you, Shannon. That, that, that I'm very touched by your words. I, I'm, I'm doing what in my heart feels uh, true to me. And it gives me pleasure when people respond to it the the way that you have and what you've just said, which which touches me profoundly because it's so sincere and it's so authentic and it, and I and it, it it just touches my heart. You know, I resonate with it in a real intimate, uh, in, a, in a very intimate way, because of the sincerity. Uh, I'm doing what I love, and I and I hope that 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 as a result of that, people feel 
a little bit of what I feel. You know, it just gives me joy. I get a lot of pleasure out of what I do day to day. I enjoy people. I enjoy working with people. I enjoy collaborating with people. I enjoy <clears throat> the curiosity behind learning about things that I don't know enough about. Uh, you know, the book is full of examples of these adventures that I've had with artisans, these incredible world-class artisans that I've had the benefit of getting to know, which initially might sound incredibly intimidating and naively maybe would have been, but through my journey and through the process of getting to know these people, in fact, uh, what I, I came to found is that there's nothing to be intimidated by, actually. These people are people that are doing what, what I aspire to do. They are uh, in love with their craft and their medium, and they aspire to be the very best that they can at it. And through their joy and their love for their craft, they've been able to garner a great amount of visibility and a following that's only fueled what they do and made them even better. And so because of my curiosity, I get to make these really great connections with these with these people, mostly because I come at it from a place of, of zero arrogance and uh, and complete enthusiasm to immerse in their world and uh, and and learn from them and and pick up what I learn and then and then apply it. Uh, uh, and so it's been this really great way to expand on what I already know uh, and then be able to take that and share it with others. So what I learn there, I apply in my work. What I learn there, I share with my clients. What I learn there, I can I can share with others and hopefully put a spotlight on that artisan to give them even more exposure. And there's, so there's something reciprocal about that. It's a pleasure to highlight them in the, in the book. It's a pleasure to highlight them through my Instagram account. It's a pleasure to, to share things that touch me along the way with others that I think might be interesting to others because uh, it feels like I get to be of service and I get to, to, to in, in a way be of purpose in, in putting a spotlight on, on something or something that touches me. And, uh, and that, that, that just makes me happy. Why well, clearly brings you joy. Well, and I, I yeah, to talk to about the books so or what they're going to find the source scene for every single photo is so in depth, so detailed, as you just mentioned, you want to bring attention to these artisans that you work with where you found these treasures and you do that. You two have, I have, have, I mean, I have a handful of decor books and some of them are sourced like this, but not most of them. And this is quite impressive. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Cause you know, people are saying, well, how did they find that? Or where did they find that? Or I would love to explore that further. So thank you for doing that for every single photo um, that is shared. All of the credit uh, related to the, <clears throat> to the detailed sources and the specificity behind everything that's in an image is is Diane. All, all of that credit goes to Diane. Uh, Diane, from the very onset of the of the concept for the book, had this very specific way that she wanted the chapters to flow. She wanted you to feel as though you were being led by the hand, by me, space to space, and and have each of those spaces reveal themselves, which is why there is so much intention behind each one of the double pages uh, and, and the images that face each other in the book so that you really get a sense of reference from left to right. You're, you're never jolted in a space. There's a real flow behind each one of the, of the double page paginations as you, as you go through. And then as an additional aid to that, there's uh, the detailed captions. And so, uh, you know, Diane had me working overtime on this part. <laughs> I, I had to go through all of my files and think really hard about where I purchased these pieces and the the person I purchased them from. And and if there was an interesting story then I, I that I wanted to share, certainly we added that as well. And she captured that with so much beauty uh, because she's such an artist at, at what she does. She's such a beautiful, eloquent writer um, and so inventive, uh, an incredible imagination. Uh, in how she writes and, and uh, just, a, just a beautiful, beautiful style. And so all of that work, all of that energy that we poured into uh, each one of those pages is represented in those captions. And then that leads to the very back of the book, which is an impressive 10 pages worth of resources. Now, here's the thing. If you know someone on your holiday list that is an aspiring interior designer 
or who is a, a designer, they're going to love this book because they've got 10 pages worth of some of the most incredible sources. And it's not limited to Paris. These are sources throughout Europe and also the United States. And it's everything from galleries to uh, the best uh, uh, fabricators, uh, artisans. I mean, it just goes on and on. And the other thing is that if you uh, haven't been to Paris or if you have been to Paris and you wanted to use the source list as a way to almost chart a path for some really interesting, fun, dynamic places to go visit, like, for example, going to the de Gournay shop in, in, in the Carreri de Gauche. Well, spectacular. Well, that particular showroom is is absolutely beautiful. And it's located in the middle. Uh, so it's just off of the Seine. And it's located in the middle of uh, of, of what's called the Carreri de Gauche, uh, which is nine uh, nine blocks worth of all of the most gorgeous antique galleries in France. So there, there's just this very tony, very luxe, very beautiful, soulful antique galleries. And you could spend an afternoon, you could spend a whole day there uh, eating at the cafes and visiting these, these antique galleries. And there's uh, many of the antique galleries that I work with are in the source list. Bichot is, is one of them, uh, as is uh, Steinitz and uh and then certainly places like like de Gournay wallpaper. And so you could make a whole uh, sort of tour <laughs> of Paris, itinerary of, of Paris uh, as a result of, uh, of, of using the, you know, utilizing the, the source book or the source page. You were so generous. This is when I saw this the first time I was reading through the book. I was like, did he seriously just open up his source book here? This is too, I was like, he's sharing all his secrets. Is, does he want to share all his secrets? No, I just felt this was just a very generous gesture to say, I'm not, I mean, because be, partly because it's your talent that then marries these treasures to create the home space. But th- that's what tells us who you are as well. It's like you're willing to share where you're inspired and that makes us appreciate your your talent even more. So I, I really appreciate this. The, the latter half of the book is something you don't often see in decor books. Um and so this is what making is what makes this book one of the many things that makes it special. Um, I, I, I think it's fantastic, David. Now, we recorded this conversation just before Thanksgiving. It was actually the day before Thanksgiving. And now we're on December 7th. And we knew this as I was recording our conversation. So I asked David to give us a taste of Paris during the winter holidays, during Christmas, and offer an idea for how to welcome it into our own homes, wherever we might call home. And he'll get to that and share a beautiful idea, as well as something that is actually an additional petit plaisir. But first, I have two more sponsors I want to introduce you to, and then we'll get back to our conversation. The Simple Sophisticate is sponsored by Masterclass. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best artists, icons, and leaders anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn about relational intelligence with Esther Pearl, discover the power and health benefits of intentional eating from Michael Pollan, and also discover how to eat with the seasons from Alice Waters. Having taken just that class from Alice Waters, I genuinely enjoyed how she takes us into her home. She takes us to the market. She sets her table with intention. She walks us through verbally, but also visually, the beauty and the the gifts that come with dining with the seasons and knowing how to cook with them deliciously as well. One unique aspect of learning from masterclass is that they're short segments packed full of information so that you can really absorb them before you go to the next session and take them with you on your walks as I have and listen to each class. Sometimes we don't want to be sitting down and watching. We want to be moving and digesting all that we're learning. I highly recommend you check it out. This holiday, give the perfect gift of an annual Masterclass membership and get one free. Go to masterclass.com slash simple today. That's masterclass.com slash simple. Terms apply. When you look at your hair, are you 100% happy? 
I have tried many products to help me improve my hair health and help me achieve my hair goals. Thicker, stronger, longer hair, for example. And thanks to Vegamore, not only am I finally seeing results, but I am finally getting the hair I have always wanted. Vegamore has transformed my hair. Their holistic approach to hair health uses smart botanicals that provide visibly thicker, fuller, longer looking hair. With help from Vegamore, get healthy, beautiful looking hair without the use of harmful chemicals. All their products are cruelty free and never contain parabens or hormones. Vegamore has something for everyone looking to improve their hair health. The Grow Revitalizing Shampoo and Conditioner Kit works together to create visibly thicker hair and improve hair from the roots. Just massage the shampoo into your scalp for 60 seconds and then follow up with conditioner. It's as simple as that. Having used their Grow Revitalizing Shampoo and Conditioner Kit, it works. And it's simple. Just a simple substitution in the shower and you too will see the results. With Vegamore, there's no risk when trying because they have a 90-day money-back guarantee with 91% of customers saying they saw visibly thicker hair with Vegamore in just three months. You won't want to run out. As a simple, sophisticated listener, get the hair you have always wanted with Vegamore. Go to vegamore.com slash sophisticate and use code sophisticate to save 20% on your first order. That's V-E-G-A-M-O-U-R dot com slash sophisticate code sophisticate to save 20% at vegamore.com slash sophisticate. <music> airing on the 7th of December. And uh, that means we're in the heart of winter holidays in Paris. I know that you're while well in San Francisco now, you'll be back in Paris soon. How do you enjoy the holidays in Paris? And is there any ideas or suggestions that maybe a Francophile in the States or anywhere who's not in France could add a little touch of Paris to their holidays? How what would you suggest? What a beautiful, beautiful question. Um, you know, I'm reminded uh, now that I'm in San Francisco of what it feels like to be in Paris for the holidays. And it's a, it's a magical time of year anywhere, really, but especially in Paris. And there's something that happens outside my window that, that, that's a gentle reminder and actually a really elegant reminder of the holiday season. And that is that uh, mid-November uh, on Yves Saint-Louis, there are these trucks at about 11 o'clock at night that start going through uh, the center core of the island to string the decorations, the holiday decorations that go from balcony to balcony all along the entire, the entire street. And so I can't tell you how magical it is because I'm usually up while they're doing this at my desk working and I can see I'm, on, I'm, I'm high enough. My apartment is located equivalent to like being in the, the, the canopy of a tree. And so I see these lovely workers coming through and, you know, spending time sort of uh, attaching these, these string of ornaments and, uh, and, and lights that, that go from one balcony to the next. And suddenly the entire, the entire length of the street is illuminated with this magical uh, uh, twinkling white lights, and it creates a glow into my apartment. At which point I no longer need to have uh, lights on in the evening, or if I have the lights on in the evening, I could put them on really dim because there's this magical glow that's coming through the shears uh, uh, that are on the windows from from uh, these, you know, the beautiful light that's along the the street. And then and then the next morning to walk downstairs and see them all strung. It's really it's a really beautiful start, uh, an official start to the holiday season on East Saint Louis for me. And so. Uh, my recommendation for how to bring a little bit of, of that of that Parisian magic uh, into your homes, you know, one of the things that I, I enjoy doing the most that I think might be the easiest is uh, purchasing flowers from my home. And the reason that makes me happy is that uh, it's twofold. One is that uh, Cajol, who is the the person that's been working at the flower shop, she's my local florist. And she's been working at this magical little flower shop that's directly across the street from uh, from my apartment. She's been there for 47 years. Uh, and she's absolutely uh, uh, charming and, and elegant and spirited and funny and fun. And, and so it's fun to just go shop flowers from her because I always enjoy the exchange. But, you know, uh, flowers aren't that expensive. They're just a little indulgence. 
and uh, what they do from a fragrance point of view and a, and a sheer beauty, um, it just, it's transformational, right? So I bring them home and I, and I, and I fill, I have this uh, vintage trophy that I picked up at a, at the Paris flea market that sits on my mantle. And I like filling that trophy with lilies, uh, usually white or beautiful pink lilies that I pick up at the market. And then I'll buy hydrangeas or, or any flowers that might be in season. And I fill each one of my spaces in my small little apartment with flowers. And I've got to say that when you, when you turn the key and you walk in the door, you know, you smell the, 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 the beautiful fragrance of, of the flowers. And then if I'm at my desk and I look over and there happens to be a little julep cup with, you know, bright pink flowers in it. And then I walk over to the coffee table and there's uh, this massive uh, bouquet of, of, of hydrangeas in bright blue or bright green. That, that just adds a level of delight to your day that makes it worth, uh, you know, the, 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 indulgence, the indulgence and the investment in, in filling your house with flowers. And, and I, I would just recommend to anyone, you know, that, that's a simple investment, but one that I think touches the soul. So enjoy. It does. And it elevates the everyday so simply. Um, I could not agree with you more. I, I, that is a perfect petite plaisir as well as a suggestion for welcoming Paris into your home and to know the florist and to be able to go down and have a conversation. And that elevates the everyday, just that connection. And I think, uh, wow, I have genuinely, genuinely enjoyed our conversation today. I, I'm so happy for your for your book. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank I, you, Shannon. As as a as we part today, let me just remind people where they can find you. Um, the book is titled Parisian by Design, Interiors by David Jimenez. And you can find David online at his website, David Jimenez Studio.com and Instagram at the same handle, David Jimenez Studio. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time during this holiday season, during your book tour to join us. Um, thank you so much. Shannon, it's been my pleasure. I, I, I've had so much fun uh, vibing off of your energy. You've made this, uh, <laughs> you've made this engaging, spirited, and, and a ton of fun. So thank you. Uh, thank you for making the time and for graciously asking me to be a part of this experience. It's been, it's been terrific. Thank you so much. I want to thank David again for joining me on today's episode. You can find all of the details, links, and information we talked about on the show notes on the blog, the simply luxurious life.com slash podcast 346. And be sure to pick up David's book written with Diane Doran Sakes, Parisian by Design, Interiors by David Jimenez. Wishing you a wonderful holiday season as we move into the heart of December. And I'll be back with a brand new episode Wednesday, December 21st. Bon journée and joie Noël. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, with the shortened URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com. For more in-depth exploration of how to cultivate your own unique, simply luxurious life, pick up my new book, which became both a bestseller and number one new release in France Travel, The Road to Le Papillon, Daily Meditations on True Contentment. Available in all four formats for your preferred reading or listening. My first book, titled Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, and my second book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, are also available in each of the four formats. Readers can now join the more intimate the Simply Luxurious Life international community by becoming members of the blog, which offers the benefits of ad-free reading site-wide, unlimited access and exclusive access to content on the blog, such as the monthly A Couple Moments with Shannon video chat, tours of my home Le Papillon, the monthly What Made Me Smile post, and monthly Ponderings post, as well as the exclusive opportunity to enter all of the giveaways during the annual French and British weeks. To stay caught up on all things Simply Luxurious, the podcast, blog post, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news, as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart each new month, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Live's free monthly newsletter, arriving on the last day of each month in your inbox. There is also a weekly newsletter, which is also free, and arrives each Friday to keep you caught up on the recent weekly posts on the blog. 
enjoy with a hot cuppa or cup of morning coffee, and stay in the know about all things Simply Luxurious. Look for two new episodes of this podcast on the first and third Wednesday of each month. And until next time, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Thank you for tuning in. Bonjour. Thank you.